Hall. I'm Dr. Ron England coming to you from Daytona State College and this is CEN 3722 Human Computer Interaction and today we're going to talk about probably my most favorite subject and my favorite part of the design process which is prototyping. Prototyping and user, uh, user testing are really my two favorite because you want to get to interact with users but you really get to feel the design process when you get to this step. So what we're gonna actually learn today is what is prototyping? And why? Why do we do prototypes? How do prototypes give us the best design? And what are some of the different techniques that you get into prototyping, like the participatory design and parallel design? We're gonna go into depth in what's called the Pictiv method, and um, I've utilized the Pictive methods many times successfully. It's a tremendous amount of fun when you actually get to do a design through the Pictive method. And the other things that we're gonna do is, obviously when you're prototyping, you're not building. So there is a financial and economic incentive to get through the prototypes relatively fast. So we're gonna look at ways to speed that up. We're gonna also look at the ways that you would use horizontal and vertical design prototypes to be able to get what's done. And we're also gonna go into the concept of dealing with scenarios. So all of that, all of those things are part of the prototyping process. But the bottom line of prototyping is that ability to look at design alternatives and get the feedback get the information and figure out which of the different ways of going about a design are the best ways. Remembering that the end product is something that the users will want and be able to use. So what is a prototype? Well, in the field of HCI, a prototype is a mock-up. It's not a final product, but it's a mock-up that shows the design itself. And what the prototyping method does is it gets rid of some of the um, issues that were, that were, when we first did software design, we had this thing called the waterfall model, where you went out and you gathered a ton of user specifications, you documented them all, you got them signed off by the user, you built the system, and then you gave it to the user at the end. And the user was never really involved in any phase other than getting those initial specifications. Well, here's what happened many times with this waterfall model. Abject and total failure. Projects that were $5 million projects, $10 million projects, $100 million projects, just completely abandoned because they didn't do what the users wanted them to do. But how could that possibly be? Obviously, they did what they wanted them to do because you got all those specifications in the early stages. But it really in the early stages, the user really doesn't know what they want. And I've actually personally gone in and, and taken over projects that would be, that were, you know, $10 million, $20 million projects to try to bring them from the brink of failure to bringing them to a successful system. And really, the key to all that was getting to your users and figuring out what to do. So let's talk a little bit more about what a prototype is. It's not a fully functional system, okay? It mocks up the system, but why do we do it? Well, we do it because we want to save money. <laughs> okay, bottom line. But you would think, well, it's something you're not, design you're not building systems, so it's costing you money. But yeah, obviously, if you build a system and you build it wrong, it's going to cost you way more money in the end. Because it doesn't have to cover the entire scope of what the final system does, they're quick and easy to build. And we're going to actually look at different ways to do this. The other nice thing about it is alternatives because there's always more than one way to solve the problem and finding the best alternative for solving that problem for that user interface is always a good thing. So let's look at some different things that we do. Well, you've probably, if you've ever designed anything, you've probably started with this. You simply start with a piece of paper and a pencil, or a piece of paper and a pen, or a piece of paper and some colored pens, okay? And you simply sketch out what you're doing. And that is the first, that's one of the major phases of prototyping, just drawing the stuff on paper. And not only can you draw what the system looks like, you can also go ahead and draw what the behavior of the system will be. It's not that hard if the piece, piece of paper and a pen to simply, oh, here's my basic background screen. I'll make a Xerox or I'll just redraw it and I'm gonna go ahead and put different behaviors in there. So 
what we're talking about when we do this is the concept of fidelity. So a lo-fi system, something is very, very simple, okay? It's simple sketches. It allows us to get pieces of the design into our heads without putting any real major investment into it. But we do levels of detail all the way up to high fidelity prototypes. So from low fidelity to high fidelity prototypes, and that's actually the stages of going through prototyping. Another great thing about prototyping is, and it's also part of, true of the development of the actual final system, is that things can be done in parallel. A very large complex system doesn't mean that I have to design and have part A completely done before I can work on the design and the prototyping of part B. I can do them both in parallel. I can also do different alternatives in parallel so that I can take the alternatives to the end users and see which ones work better for them. Okay, I can do this at both low fidelity and high fidelity. And we're going to look at some lower, you know, we're going to look at what we're doing as we move from a low fidelity system to a high fidelity system, like the, this simple sketch up to something that's actually uh, something that looks and behaves almost exactly like a working system. Okay, so we have the ability to do parts and of the design in parallel. We have the ability to do alternatives in parallel. And it also allows the ability for multiple designers to work on the same thing, uh, the different parts of it, or the same parts of it, all at the same time. That saves time. If you've got multiple designers and the ability to actually have them all working on different pieces, obviously you've got people working at a very high level. Now, part of prototyping and part of the purpose of prototyping is to involve the end users themselves. But, but the end users can be the end users that are the target market, but they can also be end users that are other designers. So one thing to note, though, however, about this process in prototyping, and one of the mistakes that people do when they get into this very user-centric design is they make the assumption that the users are the designers. Um, you know, go to the users and say, tell me what you want. Well, your job as a designer is to figure out what they want. They, you, you, get in, you have techniques for gathering information from them, but just going to them and saying, you design the system and we'll figure out how to put all that together doesn't necessarily work. You've got to guide the process as a designer. That's what you're trained to do. It's what you know how to do. So user involvement, but users aren't designing the system themselves. So let's talk a little bit about the kind of way that we can do these prototypes. A vertical prototype. So you've got a large, complex system, okay, big system. Say it's got multiple screens, it's got multiple interfaces. The concept of a vertical prototype is something that is actually going to be deep but not broad. You're going to go into one aspect of the system, and you're going to go into it in a fairly good amount of depth so that you actually can trace all the steps involved with that one aspect of the system, okay? Breadth, depth, not breadth versus the horizontal prototype, which is the exact opposite, where you're looking at the overall system, all maybe the menus, but 90% of the menus don't work, okay? But you can see the whole system as it pans out together. That's horizontal prototypes. And remember, prototypes aren't mutually exclusive. You can do some vertical prototypes and some horizontal prototypes, and then the design team can get together and figure out how to integrate those together. So if you look at this, very straightforward. Feature set, functionality, vertical versus horizontal, the ability to do both. And one of the beauties of that concept of doing vertical prototyping within a horizontal prototype system is those parts of the system that you know are going to be the most challenging for the user interface, well, guess what? You target those. Get those done and get a good interface for those, the things that the users are going to have real trouble with. Now, Reminding back to the actual iterative design process, design, prototype, evaluate, design, prototype, evaluate, repeat, design, prototype, evaluate, repeat. We do it over and over again. So as we're going through this, we're going to have to go through that evaluation phase. We're going to talk a little bit more about that evaluation phase, but I don't want anybody to forget design, okay, prototype, we build those prototypes and we evaluate them. Now let's look at this. We want to take that prototype phase, the thing that we're talking about right now, that prototype phase, and we want to be able to do that rapidly because one good reason. The more iterations you have here, good chance the better design you're going to have. 
So being able to speed up that prototype phase is going to be very, very important to you in actually getting a good design. So let's look at the different things that you can do to speed it up. Well, obviously, you don't really need to worry about system performance in a prototyped system. That's something that you do when you get down to the very end product. You can, when the people are coding it, or encoding the interfaces, you don't have to put in all the try catches and the air checking. If it's got algorithms, you can simplify those algorithms. You're, you're basically cutting corners at this phase because, again, you may be throwing it all away anyway, okay, and going to a different prototype going to a you know, different design. Okay, so don't put a lot of effort into those things. One of my favorites, which we do all the time, is we call the Wizard of Oz technique. Okay, if you're building an actual computer prototype that users are going to take a look at the prototype themselves, put a human behind the scenes. This is a lot of fun because you're playing the wizard. You're the man behind the curtain, making the things actually occur the way they should do. Okay, so it's a human not doing it, not a computer. You can also do things like there are prototype platforms that make it you know, minimal functionality, but easy to, to do. Obviously, you can create fake data that you know, just you don't have to have stuff that's completely real. So you've got lots of ways of making this process go fast. Now, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a method called the Pictive method. And um, I've utilized the Pictive method over and over again. It works very, very well. It's actually quite a bit of fun to do. I use it really more for the early design phases to get that feedback. I almost always do it in conjunction with a group of users. Um, but it's an excellent methodology for getting stuff done. And the beauty of this is it's essentially a paper model. So the materials that I do, I usually come in to, when I do a Pictive design with a large whiteboard or two whiteboards, I have about eight different colored post-it notes of different sizes. I have all sorts of different colored index cards, and I have a whole bunch of colored pens and pencils. Sometimes I actually even bring in a little printer because we can do some really cool stuff with the printer. But the bottom line is you're going to build the system with these materials. So you're literally going to get things that look like this. Um, you know, just simply written on post-it notes, written on cards. But if you want to see a real design of how this actually lays out, um, this one's on a blackboard, not a whiteboard. And yes, we use a little, bit of, a little bit of tape. But you lay out the entirety of all the screens and all the designs on paper, working your way through with the users. Now, Part of the Pictive method isn't just drawing those designs because you've got to do more than draw those designs. You've got to actually see how the interaction and the tasks are going to get done through that. So we are going to take a specific scenario of a task, something that needs to be done. We're going to implement all the different things that need to be done on colored paper. And we're going to set a deadline and we're going to go ahead and do it. Okay, It makes us think about the interface issues. But then what's really cool is we actually go through and do it. So you're taking that scenario, you're turning it into a model. We've got the whole thing and we set up a number of rules like you know, menus are always going to be done on note cards and dialog boxes are always done this way and we're going to use these colors for this. We try to. I've done this enough times to know that the rules usually fall by the wayside and the creative process really gets going. You actually end up, when you're doing Pictive, having way too many design alternatives that you have to filter through because as soon as people get hold of those pens and all the different tools, they start drawing stuff out. Doesn't have to be pretty, just have to do it. Make it work. Now, one of the things that I do in the Pictive is I set deadlines. I want to move through scenarios fast. And what will happen in a Pictive-based design is you'll get into it and you'll spend hours working on one piece. You don't, that's not the point. You spend a certain amount of uh, for design, you spend a certain amount of time to go through the actual scenario, you do a few modifications, and then you just run through the way the system would work, literally going, and being a dialog pops up and you take the card and you pop it down there on top of the little interface and say, okay, there's the dialog, the user clicks this, boom, that disappears, this happens, here's my new screen. It's a lot of fun. Now, I've talked a whole lot about scenarios. I think we really need to talk a little bit more about scenarios because the scenario is kind of the minimalist piece of putting together a design. And a scenario is 
really just that. It is a scenario. It's a specific situation that you're going to have to deal with with your user interface design. Um, you can have scenarios that are dealing that are both in the horizontal or the vertical domain of the actual prototypes. Okay, I've got a task that needs to be performed. It's relatively complex. I'm going to write up a scenario for this, and we're going to actually work through it. It's, it's, it's minimalist because it goes even further and easier than the Pictive design, which was all on paper. Now, you do want to capture the scenarios on paper. So what we've really got is a scenario with a user and a specific type of user because systems can have different kinds of users. You can say, this is a scenario for a novice user okay, using this on a PC to achieve a specific, they want to have this occur, here's the situation, and we don't want it to take too long. So, you know, a simple scenario, and we can come up with hundreds of scenarios because you do this all the time, but a simple scenario. Okay, what happens? We want to go ahead and withdraw some money from an ATM. What is the scenario that occurs there? You walk up to the ATM, you insert your card. Oh, wait, we've got to take into account that maybe they're going to put the card in one way or the other. They're presented to enter their PIN number. They enter their PIN number. They're presented with a set of choices. What are those choices going to be? Their objective is that they want to withdraw $100. Okay, so one of the choices is withdraw $100. They hit the button, withdraw $100. The money pops out, the card pops out, and they leave. Okay. Okay, well, that's a specific scenario. Obviously, not the only scenario that can happen in an ATM machine. I know that because every time I get behind somebody at an ATM machine, they take seven minutes to 10 minutes to get something done. I never have been in an ATM machine for more than about 45 seconds. And I go in, I got one thing I want to do, boom, it's done, and I'm out of there. I don't know what those other people are doing. Maybe staring at the screens. Maybe the interface is too bad. Good ideas for things that you can design. But these are real, real issues in developing a scenario. So what do we use them for? Okay, we want to express how will the user interact with the system, that concept of interaction. The user isn't thinking about menus and buttons. They're thinking about, I want to go to the ATM machine and I want to get $100 out. Okay, you as a designer are thinking about they need to insert the card. The card can be inserted either one direction or the other. They need to present it with a menu. The menu needs to have these choices. The, the user is going to select these choices. This is going to happen. Okay, that's what you do. Scenarios are great. Scenarios are actually probably the first thing that you're always going to do in dealing with any type of design issue in HCI. Okay. Look at what the user's objectives are, and we're going to talk a lot more about scenarios, so just know, you know that you're going to have to have that ability to document and build from scenarios. Okay, And remember that I presented you with a single scenario which created an interface. But you're going to have hundreds of scenarios for the same thing, which all are going to be part of that same exact interface. So don't think of scenarios as an end-all because scenarios are just dealing with a specific set of circumstances. So, in summary, do you know what a prototype is? Do you know what the Pictive method is? Can you look at how users are going to interact in the prototyping process? Are you going to look at how you can do designs in parallel? Can you do these things? And what are some methods to get through the prototype process fast? Because remember, when you're prototyping, you're not building, okay? And the bottom line is you need to end up with a built system. So getting through the prototype process quickly to allow you to get into that build process is really going to help you out. Do you know the difference between horizontal and vertical prototypes and how they're going to be used? And what is a scenario and how to use a scenario in prototyping? Hopefully we've covered all those things here and you've got a really good feel for it. Prototyping is going to be one of the most important steps that you actually do in the design process. Now, that whole phase of the design process, now that we're moving past prototyping, we're going to move into the evaluation phase, and you're going to be able to put all of this together. So hopefully you learned a lot from this, this uh, little lecture here, all about prototyping, one of the greatest phases in design, a lot of fun, also a lot of work, but great rewards and the ability to build truly awesome designs. I'm Dr. Ron England, signing out from Daytona State College. Thank you very much.